My name is Park Chung Hwan, a dentist practicing in Ulsan Hub Dental Clinic. Today, I'm going to give a lecture on hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus by using Dionavi system. The subtitle is a clinical study on strategic wide membrane elevation and a discussion on membrane perforation. This is slightly different from the commonly known method of hydraulic elevation, but it has many advantages. This is my bio. I personally really enjoy traveling and have been to about 30 countries. I think I'll be going out to four more countries this year. I was a free-spirited person. I say it in the past tense, but now that my children are getting older, I think I'll be able to travel again. These are the places I've been to. Here the first is Cancun, Mexico. Second is Cuba. Third is Mexico. Fourth is Okinawa, this is Panicale, this is Bolivia, and New Zealand. This is Samos, a Greek island. Let's look at the table of contents first. First, we will look at what happens to ossification when we perform a lot of strategic hydraulic elevation using Dionavi. Then, secondly, we will discuss the clinical usefulness of performing a strategic wide-range hydraulic elevation of sinus membrane. And thirdly, I will talk about the mechanics behind the strategic wide-range elevation method using NAVI. Fourth, this is something that many young clinicians would be particularly interested in. We will discuss checking membrane perforation, and lastly, we will do a summary. First, Let's look at ossification that occurs when a strategic wide-range hydraulic elevation is performed using Dionavi. I purposely added 11 cases from the order of short follow-up to long ones. This is the first case. It had a 4.5-month follow-up. You see the before and after the surgery. Do you see the cursor? If you follow the cursor, you can see there was a line of remaining bones. It was here. I planted on the day of the surgery and did a bit of bone grafting. You can see the membrane has been lifted a lot. I put in more than 3 cc per tooth. For this case, there is something to consider. I need to make three holes. But for numbers 14 and 15, if it's placed ambiguously, it will go in on one side while the side would leak. So the membrane. The elevation lifts what's next to it a little bit as well. So you might be curious about what to do when this happens. First, you can read it here. The method I used is, I put a hole where the maxillary cortical line is more flat between numbers 14 and 15. So I elevated the membrane, since it rips less on this side. It's better than when there is a slope. So I performed hydraulic elevation in the number 15 area and strategically added over 4 cc's. Then the membrane elevates on this side and elevates to number 14 as well. If I added only 1 cc or 2 cc, it wouldn't elevate number 14 as well. But if you don't add enough, it will only elevate slightly. Then the problem is that when you try to put it in here, water will leak from here. So the membrane might not elevate anymore. So there are two methods. So there are two methods to prevent water leakage when performing consecutive hydraulic elevation. First is to finish one to the end. If I plant the fixture, it blocks the hole and so there is no leakage. There is that method and the second way is, like I did before, to strategically elevate the membrane that is less ripped between the two but elevate it very highly. The membrane then lifts the area next to it as well. That's a method. In my point of view, I think the latter method that I explained is a bit more quick and easy. So the sinus elevation was done, and this is the CT after four months and two weeks later. I placed the prosthesis a bit earlier. Of course, when there is more remaining bones, it has been proven by evidence that the prognosis of the implant is good. So the amount and quality of the remaining bones is important. From my experience in clinical trials, when there is more or less 4 millimeters of the remaining bones, it's not necessary to wait for a long time. 
so I tend to place the prosthesis a bit earlier. In this case, because the remaining bones were used a lot, I placed the prosthesis in just four months and two weeks. You can check by looking that quite a lot of the bone has been generated. This is number 15. For number 17, there is something like another maxillary sinus inside the maxillary sinus. If you look, do you see the cursor in this space? Since I elevated the membrane completely, the bones gradually fill up this space. You see the previously existing bone line, but even in one year, this line will become very faint because of ossification. So I captured numbers 14, 15, and 17. In coronal view, you see number 14, which had relatively more remaining bone, and numbers 15 and 17, which had relatively less remaining bones. Since I elevated the membrane, you can see that the bones filled up a lot. But a common question is that it's only four months and two weeks now, but in one year, wouldn't it sink down a lot? Would that really happen? We'll consider this as we look at the following cases. So the actual amount of elevation is about this much. Also to note, I divided 0.2 cc's of the bone material and added them to the three holes for this case. I barely put any in. It's a very small amount. You may think that the bone graft material should be playing the role of a tent, but if there's so little, it can't play the tent role and it may relapse the whole area. But that's not necessarily true. This is because if the tension elevates the membrane widely, then the bone graft material is only there to aid. Like we say, the left hand is there to just support. It doesn't play a major role. I'll show this to you again in another case later. So the conclusion is that even after one year, I don't expect the current line to change much for this case. Let's look at a nine-month case. It's a case with a nine-month follow-up. This one is interesting. For number 26, only the membrane is elevated. There's very little bone grafting for number 27. So you can see the membrane is lifted, it's elevated well, it's not ripped. Then after a while, here's the follow-up image. To compare number 26 and number 27, I'll show you this. For number 26, I only elevated the membrane. I only elevated the membrane so you can see the membrane is lifted. For number 27, I did both membrane elevation and a little bit of bone grafting. There is a difference. If you look closely, there is quicker ossification in number 27. For number 26, if you look at the cursor, you can see that ossification of this area hasn't occurred. So you might think that it's better to add bone grafting material, but this is not necessarily true, because they will look the same one year later. To me, adding bone grafting material has the same difference as building a house on a flat land without anything and building a house with a framework. There's a difference in the ossification speed, but when the house is complete one year later, the completed house will be the same. You can think of it like that. So, of course, if you add the bone grafting material, ossification will occur faster, but it will be almost the same one year later as if you didn't add the bone grafting material. You can think about it in this way. Next, let's look at a 10-month follow-up case. This is an interesting case. If you look carefully, when you look at the panorama image right after surgery, you can see that the membrane is highly elevated. I think more than 4 cc's were added. The membrane is very highly lifted, but the bone grafting material is only in the back. It's only in the back. Why is it like this? Since the membrane is elevated and the patient is lying down, the bone grafting material all fell to the back. That's why this happened. So the bone grafting material was added only on the distal side. This patient case was very unique. This was taken on the day of surgery. This is one month later. One month after the routine surgery, I took an x-ray. This is standard, because you can know most of the time if it's failed after one month. So I took the x-ray. If you look closely, there's a cortical bone line. The existing cortical bone line is not visible, even though it has been only a month. This means that ossification is happening. So in this case, ossification occurred quickly. A month later, I added the prosthesis a bit early as well. I think I added it maybe in about five months. You can see that ossification is progressing well. This is a panorama view. You can know for certain in the CT. You can see the existing line. Since it hasn't been a year yet, you can still see the existing line. This line is where the membrane was lifted to. It's this line, and the bone is here. A new cortical bone has formed, 
It's formed very well. A new line has been made. This bone likely has very high quality as well. Because for the mesial side, the bone graft material was hardly involved, the bone graft material could have spread more evenly and could have affected the mesial side as well, but surely the bone quality would be better. So, when you look at the before and after photos from different sides, the existing line is about here. This is about 8.5 in length, so I think the previous remaining bone was about 4 millimeters. About 3.5 to 4 milliliters, so it was lifted by about 5 milliliters. The cortical bone line formed really well. Ossification is progressing well. Next, the fourth case is a one-year and two-month follow-up case. For this case, I only performed membrane elevation. I didn't perform GBR for this case. On the day of surgery, you can see that the membrane is elevated quite a lot from the cortical bone line. I think about 3 cc's were added. Then, as time passes, the line becomes more and more clear. It means ossification is happening. This was probably the day of the surgery. There's something special about this. When you strategically elevate the maxillary sinus membrane this much, there is something unique about the healing aspect. If you look, I elevated it this much on the day of the surgery. I elevated it a lot, but after two to five months, there's much mucous membrane hypertrophy. So there is more hypertrophy than the day of the surgery. Take a look. So you can think of it as a healing process. Because the membrane was elevated on the day of surgery, blood clot filled up and in the process of it gradually becoming granulation tissue, mucous membrane hypertrophy occurs temporarily. It occurs temporarily and then it stabilizes. When it stabilizes, a definite cortical bone line forms. Also, if you see here, it's like this on the panorama. Ossification is good. The bone formed well. We can view it like that. Next, we'll look at a one-year, ten-month follow-up case. I've placed two implants. You don't really have to look at the back one. All of these were placed using Dionavi. For the back one, I placed it where the bone line is, so you don't need to think about this one, but consider the front tooth only. There's about half of the existing line, about half of a fixture. The membrane was elevated. And after time went by, about one year and ten months, the cortical bone line in the maxillary sinus formed again. A new line formed. Number 27 was planted strategically where the existing bone was. So it doesn't matter, but if you look at number 26, you can see the membrane elevation. You can also see the black part in the middle. This is either air or blood. So after one year and ten months, the cortical bone line has been newly formed, and if you look carefully, it's surrounded well by the bone to the fixture apex. This is very significant mechanically. It widely surrounds the fixture apex. Generally, I recommend a 0.8 cc implant to place one. To place a single using hydraulic elevation, I recommend 0.8 cc elevation. If we lift with 0.8 cc, it elevates a little bit and relaxes later so it surrounds the fixture apex very thinly. When compared to the cases with a lot of mechanical hydraulic elevations done strategically, it's clear that these as a whole, the surrounding bones, are much more mechanically superior. Rather than surrounding it like this, this is one year and ten months later. You can see in the panorama view that a lot of bone formation has occurred. Now let's look at a two-year and six-month follow-up case. I didn't perform GBR, but only elevated the membrane. In the panorama view, you can see the elevated membrane and that a lot of blood has formed with time. Immediately after the surgery, the membrane is lifted a lot. What's interesting is that the membrane is elevated a lot on the side of number 26. I think I added less saline on number 27, so the membrane elevation is a little less. So if you look carefully for number 26, the apex is definitely surrounded, but for number 27, it feels a little thin. This means that if the membrane is lifted a lot, then more bone is able to form as well. This case shows that difference. Next, let's look at a two-year and 11-month follow-up case. This patient had pretty severe diabetes. 
I removed the tenth molar tooth. After that, haziness was very severe. In other words, a severe maxillary sinusitis was developed. I thought the cause was dental infection, so I placed an implant right after extraction. I didn't do GBR, but only elevated the membrane. If you look at the membrane, this is the day of the surgery. As time passed, the mucous membrane lifted a lot temporarily, then it stabilizes. I followed up for two years and 11 months. Haziness was severe on the day of the surgery, but I ignored it and proceeded with the surgery. Since I extracted the tooth, I thought the haziness will definitely go away. About five months later, mucosal thickening has occurred temporarily, and as it proceeds, ossification occurs and the cortical bone line becomes visible. And if you look at number 15, maxillary sinus floor has newly formed. Do you see the cursor? You can see that the cortical bone has formed above the apex, like this. For number 17, there wasn't as much remaining bone as expected. The membrane is elevated in this area, and as it's stabilized, you can see that a new cortical bone line formed. This is a CT image three months after the surgery. It shows the characteristic healing appearance that is seen after a lot of membrane elevation. In my experience, not always though, in more cases than expected, temporary thickening of the mucous membrane occurs within two to five months after surgery. This CT was taken after a little over three months, but if you look closely, you can see that there is a lot of temporary thickening of the mucous membrane. For this case as well, the surgery was done using the Dionavi system. I added more saline than the amount that was suggested in the surgery protocol you see here on the Dionavi planner. So since the total length here is 8.5 millimeters, you can assume that there are about 3 millimeters to 4 millimeters of residual bone. This is two years and two months after the surgery. After a long time since the surgery, the cortical bone line has set clearly and surrounds the apex well. And this is a three-year follow-up case. Even by looking at the panorama view, you can see that a lot of bone is formed. And you can see that the previous cortical bone line has changed like this. This much of the bone has formed again. I added implants excluding number 6. If you look at the remaining bones on number 6, you can see that a lot of bone has formed. Three years after the surgery, you can see a lot of bone formation just on panorama view. If you compare the before and after the surgery, you can definitely see a lot of bone formation overall. This is because of membrane elevation. Now let's look at a three-year and one-month follow-up case. If you look at the panorama view, the maxillary sinus floor looks sunken and it looks like it's gone down deeply. So I lifted the membrane a lot. And after about three years, the cortical bone line has formed clearly. A new line has been made. Previously, it had been dug down much deeper but now you can see that there is a line on the top. When we look at a three-year follow-up case, you can see a lot of bone formation. Because the membrane was elevated, it doesn't relax, and a lot of bone formation happens. This CT compares the day of the surgery and three years and one month after the surgery. If you look closely, I sectioned the CT almost in the same location. It was to attain clear comparisons through CT. Look at the location of the membrane elevation on the day of the surgery. That location is still maintained even three years later. This means the membrane did not relax. Is it just for this case? No, it's not. There are plenty of cases where it does relax. But it doesn't relax as much as you would expect. We'll take a look at a three-year and six-month follow-up case. This case used a small amount of GBR. It's number 20. If you look at number 20, this is before surgery. This is right after the surgery. The membrane is lifted. I think I added about 3 cc's. Take a look at 50 days after the surgery. You can see temporary mucus thickening and then ossification as it stabilizes. So this is what the oral cavity looks like after 3 years and 6 months. You can see that the membrane of the maxillary sinus is raised. Immediately after the surgery, membrane elevation finished well on the day of the surgery. This is the one-year follow-up. Ossification has not been completed. You can still see the previous line, and you can see bones in between that haven't been completely ossified.
This is the CT from the same period. Now, lastly, let's look at a four-year and two-month follow-up case. This case is a meaningful case to me. After I checked the case prognosis four years later, this case made me realize that I can use my membrane elevation method as a default routine. At this time, I added more than 3 cc's of saline. This case actually had a lot of remaining bone. Because there was a lot of remaining bone, even if the membrane was penetrated, the surgery could have proceeded. But at the time, the popular trend was different. There are many opinions that it doesn't matter if the membrane is perforated if there is a lot of remaining bone. But at the time, the prevailing opinion was that membrane elevation was still needed. So the surgery was done in 2016, and I elevated the membrane. I elevated it, and this case also showed sudden mucous membrane thickening. It thickens temporarily and then ossifies gradually. I removed the front teeth later as well. I used the DioNavi system to place front teeth implants. I proceeded with the navigation surgery. During the posterior teeth surgery, the membrane elevation was done widely, so a lot of bone formation occurred, which made the anterior surgery quite easy. This is before the surgery and the follow-up after four years and two months. About this much bone is formed. So I strategically elevated the membrane for numbers 6 and 7. If you look at number 6, there is temporary mucous membrane thickening. Since there was so much thickening, all of this area became bone. To put it simply, since the thickening here becomes bone, number 5 ossification also occurs. So the implant was done easily for number 15 surgery as well. This is four years and two months later. I sectioned almost at the same location. The new bone formation is very good. Let's summarize. For strategic hydraulic elevation of the maxillary sinus, I personally recommend injecting more than 3 cc's per tooth. It will be very good for bone formation afterward. And how about the quality of the bone formation? Of course, the quality might not be good if you add heterogeneous bone or synthetic bone. Allogeneic bone will be much better. The bone that forms through membrane elevation without adding artificial bone can be considered autogenous bone, so the quality would be definitely better. You can think of it that way. So what's most important is that when you elevate the membrane overall, so high elevation with about 3 cc's rather than 0.8 cc's, then the tension goes down overall. So in the surgical method we did in the past, we added about 0.8 to 1 cc's for elevation and tried to fill the area with bone graft material to prevent relapse. But if we raise the maxillary sinus membrane a lot, then the adjacent membranes will also lift and the tension will go down. So the power to return to how it was decreases. So that's the biggest difference there. The clinical result is that if we strategically elevate a lot, then the bones form better more widely. What is the biggest factor that decreases the tension, the tendency for the membrane to come back down? Elevate the membrane a lot. If you elevate only a little, then since there are a lot of membranes attached to the cortical bone, there is tension to return to its original state, resulting in a lot of relapse. So if you detach the adjacent membranes as well, then relapse does not occur easily. And what about the space inside? But you actually don't need to fill it with that much bone graft material. Because as the membrane becomes loose and doesn't relapse, blood clot forms in between. As this mass fills the space, tissues form within one to two weeks after the surgery. So the blood clot maintains the volume of the space after membrane elevation. So this is why more bone formation occurs later on. I've been doing my surgeries using this strategic wide-range sinus elevation for about six years. In fact, I almost always add more than 3 cc's for maxillary sinus lift. So if this simple change of inserting a relatively larger volume of saline wide elevation of the membrane, which means adding 3 cc's rather than 1 cc, brings good results, it's worth trying. And currently, I do guided surgery for more than 90% of the surgeries.
For general surgery, I use the general surgical kit, but for most maxillary sinus elevation surgery, I use the DioNavi guided surgery system. The second topic, we'll look at it briefly, a brief discussion on the clinical usefulness of strategically wide hydraulic elevation. I explained earlier already. The bone quality would definitely be better. Like I mentioned before, if we don't add anything or just a little bit of GBR material, then the bone that forms after it can be thought of as a tautogenous bone. Personally, I prefer allogeneic bone when using bone graft material. Many are concerned about relapse where the volume goes back down when allogeneic bone is used. But when the membrane is elevated a lot like this, you don't need to calculate the amount of relapse due to allogeneic bone, so a better prognosis can be expected with a small amount of allogeneic bone. So from a business point of view, if you use the method that elevates the membrane a lot, then you can save the cost on bone graft material, since the bone graft material doesn't have to play the role of keeping the tension. When the membrane is raised a lot, then the role of tenting that the bone graft material played in the existing surgical method is played by the membranes. From a mechanical point of view, it very thinly lines this fixture around the apex. If we only add 0.8 cc's according to the previous method, but if you elevate the membrane using the method I use, then the membrane around the apex area gets filled overall, so there is much stability mechanically. Of course, to be evidence-based, the bone quality and quantity of the alveolar adjustment area, that is the remaining bone, determine the prognosis of the implant. For loading, there is a lot of loading in the alveolar adjustment area. But in the mechanical perspective, it is certainly much better if there is a lot of bone surrounding the apex side. In such respect, I think that there is usefulness in the surgical method that elevates the membrane a lot. Thank you for your attention. I'll continue my lecture with part two next week. Thank you.